1909, Anaheim, California. Home of the Mighty Ducks and for a few summers, the Angels of Los Angeles. In a barn on a ranch growing vegetables and melons was born Clarence Leonidas Fender. And he would soon spark it, the music industry. He grew up learning piano before he found an affinity for the saxophone, but oddly enough, he was not really a guitar player in his youth and never really became one in his adult life. Was a total hipster though. He was into electronics way before they were cool and honestly, before most people even had them in their homes. Now Leo liked to tinker. He would take parts from his uncle's old auto shop and put them together and see what he can do with them, especially the radios and the loud noises that came with them really hit home. But after high school, you gotta grow up, right? So Leo went to Fullerton Junior College, majored in accounting and took a few bookkeeping jobs, but they were during the Great Depression, so they didn't really work out and he soon abandoned the accounting career for a more entrepreneurial one. Now after losing his third job of the decade, he just began his own radio repair company and from there, it was off. Local musicians began coming to him to work on their PA systems and figuring out a way to amplify acoustic instruments. Now as World War II picked up, many electronics companies stopped producing for the public in order to support the war effort. So Leo, being able to fashion something together with a bunch of loose parts that were still laying around, became mighty valuable. And it was still an important industry because there were a lot of bands playing in local dance halls that still needed PA systems and some sort of amplification. Now for Leo, he wasn't eligible to serve during World War II because when he was eight years old, he developed a tumor in his left eye and it had to be removed, replacing it with the glass eye. If that hadn't happened, there may not have been a Fender company. In the 40s, Doc Kaufman, an inventor with Rickenbacker, teamed up with Leo to create the K&F Manufacturing Corporation where they would produce Hawaiian lap steel guitars and amplifiers as a kit. Fender actually had a patent on the pickup that was used in the kit. Now one of the things they created, the K&F Manufacturing Company, was a prototype for a solid body electric guitar that had a bright tone and a long sustain. Two things that were very unusual at the time for an electrified guitar. Fender created something that people wanted, not just something they needed. But in 1946, Doc pulled out and Leo created the Fender Electric Instrument Company, which would later become the brand. Fender. At the time, Doc thought all the money was going to be in repairs, but Leo saw the future in manufacturing, and it's a good thing he stuck with it. Now seeing the potential for the future of the electric guitar, in 1950 he created the Fender Esquire, a solid body electric guitar with one pickup. Of course it had some issues with truss rods and it wasn't very versatile having only one pickup, so he went back to the drawing board after hearing from local musicians and added in a truss rod. And added in a second pickup, and renamed it the Fender Broadcaster. The only problem was at the time, Gretsch, another instrument manufacturer, had a drum kit called the Broadcaster, it was just spelled differently, so he went back and renamed it the Telecaster. Now, originally it was used in a lot of country music, rockabilly, and rock and roll, but to this day the Telecaster is still used, and it spans all genres, even being used in heavy metal bands like Slipknot. And from the popularity of the Telecaster, the entire Fender Empire was born. Stratocasters, precision basses, bass man amplifiers, reverb amplifiers, all because he had the vision to believe in the power of the electric guitar. Now in 1965, due to serious health conditions, including a severe staph infection, he sold Fender to CBS for $13 million, which was $2 million more than CBS had purchased the New York Yankees for the previous year. He had a 10 year non-compete agreement, but after those 10 years was up, his health started improving and he became the head of the Music Man Company, which is now under Ernie Ball. He worked there and then 10 years later, in 1985, at age 74, he co-founded another company, the G&L Music Company, and he continued working until he passed away in 1991 at age 81. He was a man that continued to make things better by making better things. Now in his spare time, he was very interested in cameras and boats. Not photography and boating, 
but cameras and boats. Camera manufacturers would actually send him prototypes and rather than use them, he would take them apart and see how they work. His wife Phyllis actually said one time when they were out on vacation, she would take pictures of sunsets and flowers and things like that, and all his snapshots would be of gears and motors. Similarly with boats, he was more interested in how the machines worked. There was a Bay Area boating manufacturer that actually sent him blueprints and he would make little corrections and send them back and they would work in tandem. This is the guy making guitars and amplifiers that's also designing boats. Of course, he didn't mind cruising in the boats every once in a while, but his real passion was in the design work. This is a man that was truly more interested in the journey than the destination. So Leo Fender, man born in a barn, raised in a ranch. Lost his eye when he was a child, lost multiple jobs during the Great Depression. Never materialized a career from the degree he got in college. Still wound up creating one of the greatest companies in the history of music. Now to me, that's inspirational. But how about you? Leave a comment down below and tell me whose life might inspire you. Like, share, subscribe if you found this video entertaining or informational. And I will see you in the next one. B-Row, ouch.